Dear colleagues, guests, um, I think we can start our meeting. And uh, probably I should introduce myself. I'm Vidas Polinauskas, uh, the chair of Young Academy of Lithuania Academy of Sciences. And on behalf of Young Academy, I would like to welcome you uh, to this meeting. And uh, I would like to thank you for your time and also for your interest in the research which will be presented by, by our guest. Professor uh, Arturas Bailonis uh, from Stanford University. Uh, I would like also to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, also a uh, member of Young Academy, uh, Dr. Mangerdas Malinauskas from uh, uh, Laser Research Center, Vilnius University. And before uh, you, Mangerdas, will introduce maybe more deeply about this research uh, uh, field and uh, about professor and, and his work. Uh, I would like to say that this, uh, this presentation will be recorded and uh, later available online as well. So, Mangi, this microphone is yours. Okay, thank you, Vaidi, for introducing me. So, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks in advance for listening. A few more words about uh, our guest. So, Dr. Arunas Vailonis has uh, finished Vilnius University. Yes. 30 years ago or so, or a bit more, and uh, got his PhD degree in, in Stockholm, in Royal Institute of Technology, and later he continued on his career in, in USA, in the University of Illinois, and, and finally, as said already, in Stanford University. He's also giving lectures both in Stanford University and Kaunas University of Technology. Uh, and it, it's, it's my personal pleasure that we have some already common research, uh, which maybe in small part will be shown here, or at least mentioned. And uh, next uh, to it, I could say only that this talk is more uh, introductionary, uh, tutorial-like, and tomorrow we'll have a more technical one for the ones who are interested in Laser Research Center. But since today we have uh, participants and at the same time not, not too many of them so you are highly expected to have more questions from each of you I will be counting okay uh, so this is it in brief and please Arturi take your time and, and enjoy and enjoy us thank you okay. everybody hear me okay uh, 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 hello everyone and yeah my name is Arturas Voilonis, and I'm currently um, working at Stanford University and mostly managing uh, shared facility. And sh my shared facility consists of uh, X-ray diffraction instruments and also X-ray microscopy instrument, which I will present in I will present today. So you're familiar probably with X-ray diffraction, X-ray microscopy. Probably you're also familiar from the medical uh, field, where you go and somebody does CT on you, uh, computer tomography. So here we do CT on materials and with much higher resolution. So that's what I would like uh, probably to talk today. So I this lecture will be more uh, introductory. So Mangada said about our uh, joint uh, kind of research we're doing, but I won't show the teeth. <laughs> Sorry. But I will show other things, so, which will be also cool, okay? Uh, so this particular um, trip and this particular lectures were uh, financed by Baltic American Freedom Foundation, which is gratefully offered some um, uh, funding for, for my trip and visiting Vilnius and giving this uh, presentation. Also, a very thankful to Vilnius University, Mangardas, Irma and all of you, so that Mangal has made it happen. So there are lots of, there are some bureaucracy, as you know, involved. So everything was cleared, and we're finally meeting here together, so which is great. Okay, so uh, I will move on then. Uh, this is a brief outline. Uh, I will try to stick to this outline, but it's not necessarily very uh, rigorous, but. I'll talk a little bit about introduction, which relates to X-rays in general, then uh, yeah, properties of X-rays, and then the basic uh, 
X-ray imaging, why we have images with X-ray sound, what is the computer tomography, and then I will show you the instrument which I have in my lab, and there are many of these type of instruments uh, which work the same principles. And then, of course, the coolest part probably will be examples, which I will present some uh, different uh, materials, different uh, samples measured using this uh, uh, CT. Okay, and then summary. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Stanford is. It's uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so you're familiar with Silicon Valley, I think. So it's in the center of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, a small city where the Hewlett Packard is based and many, many other companies. So the Stanford is in the middle of this uh, melting pot of different companies. And of course, uh, Stanford is famous for spitting out startups one after another. Google was uh, made by Stanford. Um, Sun Microsystems, I think, if you remember that one, uh, the old computer company, so, and the, there are many companies. So, so here you see this uh, oval, which is the uh, center of Stanford. We have a very nice church at Stanford as well, built when the Stanford was built. And my lab is right there in this building, very close to the church. So it's very, sometimes, you know, you can go and relax there. It's denominational church. It's not Catholic, not Protestant, nothing. Anybody is welcome, and sometimes uh, people are doing uh, just relaxing. There. So, so we have very nice organs there, like four of them, and there is, there, they play organ music in there as well, which is yes, very good acoustics. Okay, the science in my field happens in this science engineering quad. So we have uh, shared facilities in here, in this building. Then also some shared facilities are underground in those two buildings, mostly vibration sensitive instruments like transmission electron microscope, high resolution scanning electron microscopes, uh, focused ion beam instruments. And recently we got an opportunity to populate more instruments in this building, which right now is not well occupied, but we have lots of space there. And we already got funding to renovate, so probably we'll get huge space there and probably we'll put more instruments. So we are expanding this uh, nano, well, we'll call nano, but it's a shared facility. And we're putting more instruments into shared facilities that people can use from uh, different uh, departments, from different companies. We have Tesla, we have Apple coming to us as well. So, so okay. Uh, okay, let's do then and see what the x-rays are. So you're probably familiar with Wilhelm Conrad Drungen. So he by accident discovered x-rays. And by accident means, so he was playing with the different vacuum tubes. And uh, one of the vacuum tubes he wrapped in a paper. And then by accident there was a photographic film next to, to this tube. And it got exposed. And he was kind of puzzled why it exposed. That's, I think, one of the reasons X-rays are X-rays, because X stands for the unknown. So, so he named it X-rays. And then immediately after that, he understood that probably X-rays go through material, which was the paper. Then he, very next experiment was done on his wife's hand. So he put his wife's hand in the X-ray beam and got this image. And as you can see in the image, there are different uh, contrasts or different levels. And those levels, as you can see, the soft tissue is lighter. Then there is a bone, which is more dense, and it's darker. And there is a ring, which is very dark. So you can say that, OK, X-rays penetrate the material, but density of the material determines the penetration depth or, penet or how X-rays are capable of penetrating. And of course, that depends also on the X-ray energy. So when you generate X-rays, usually the lab source generation of the X-rays happens on a, in a vacuum where you have a filament which emits electrons. Then you have accelerating voltage. And those electrons are accelerated to kilovolts. And they hit the target. And usually the target is a metal. Could be copper, could be silver, could be molybdenum, or any other target, tungsten, for example. 
So when you hit metal with the electrons, electrons will rapidly slow down, and the difference in energy, some of the energy is emitted by as X-rays. 99% goes into heat, 1% goes to X-rays. And if you look the um, spectral characteristics of your X-rays, they would look like this. Uh, and I'm showing here these uh, curves which are kind of smooth. This is the called continuous radiation or white radiation or Bremsstrahler. There are different words for this. And you see they start at particular wavelength, which is short wavelength limit. That's where the, you can imagine that the electron which flies towards the target will hit the target at this energy. And if you stop this electron by energy conservation law, all the energy is converted into X-rays. That's why you have this short wavelength limit, which is exactly wavelength of that electron, which just released all the energy into X-rays. And then it, it's a smooth curve here. At some point, that you start to generate characteristic lights. I don't want to talk about this right now. But generally, for the tomography or for X-ray imaging, we would use this uh, broad spectrum, for example. Sometimes you can use monochromatic X-rays as well, but the instrument which I'm using will be the broad spectrum of X-rays. So when X-rays go through the material, as you saw on this uh, Rongens 5, there are different uh, gray levels, right? And this is related to X-ray absorption in the material. So you have absorption coefficient mu here, and you have incident intensity of the beam here. Of course, you're obtaining beam here, Ix, which is related to this uh, uh, equation. So, so there's different linear attenuation coefficient of different parts in, in that hand or in any material, what you will have, you will have this contrast. And one of the famous contrasts, of course, would be the chest x-ray. When you go to the doctor, you immediately see uh, this kind of, you know, you stand and they will shine x-rays through you and you, they will get this image and they will look for something in that image. And then, of course, you can improvise and see what else you can do. You can do something like that, go through the computer and through the hands. Of course, you can do Simpson brain as well, imaging, which is very small. So <laughs> in this case, you can do many, many things. And imaging is one thing. As you can see in a chest x-ray, you just take one image. And one image means you see everything through. It's the same as you have lots of slides you prepare, let's say, slides for some kind of talk. Nobody does that anymore, probably, but in my time, by PhD student, I was preparing slides. If you put the slides together, you look through, so you will see everything together. In tomography, we will do more than that. So we'll try to understand where the things are in the volume. So that's a big difference between uh, uh, imaging and between tomography. And I will try to tell you roughly how this tomographic imaging is done. So what do we need for X-ray imaging? We need ideal X-ray point source. Ideal, I mean no size. And then ideal detector. Detector, the pixel is unlimitedly small, delta function, right? And of course, you cannot reach these characteristics, of course. You have, of course, X-ray source, which has a size, and then you have a detector, and you have also other uh, events happening during the imaging, like, for example, scattered radiation might distort your image as well. But with all that, of course, we try to control these things, and from that, of course, we also we have a background, and we have a limited resolution of the instrument. If you, know, if you have X-ray source as an ideal point, then probably resolution will be much, much higher than uh, what we have with, with these instruments right now. So first thing, what of course we would like to see from our instrument is a high contrast ratio. So when you have something put into image, in, into the X-rays, you want to see that image. So it means you have to have a contrast. And the contrast would be defined as the difference in brightness of one object versus the uh, background. And if this difference in brightness is not great, then you can relate that directly to intensity difference of, the, of, of your uh, X-rays. And the detec detector will count your counts, right? So the detector counts photons, 
means you're counting the intensity. So this is nice. Uh, another thing is that also in extra intensity will depend on thickness. Let's say you have one leaf and you have two leaves, of course intensity changes, and that's related to your uh, linear absorption attenuation coefficients of the background and of the object. For example, if you think this is object, this is, uh, this is background and this is object, so you'll have this uh, relationship of, of the contrast here. So everybody probably has phone or camera or something, you have this, um, then, and you know the, each camera is characterized by the number of pixels, right? So the better, the more pixels you get, 12 million pixels is a good camera, uh, maybe 10,000 pixels is a bad camera. The same is related as well in a, in a tomography because we have a detector which, of course, he has pixels. And pixel, you know, it's a two-dimensional object. And when you, you know, take a photograph, you have that uh, already image consists of these pixels right here. In CT, we'll talk about voxels. Voxels, you have to add a third dimension. So when you have a three-dimensional object, then the pixels become cubes, small cubes, which we call voxels. And usually you, you can, of course, you can say pixel if you understand what, what it means, but sometimes you will hear word voxel, which defines a three-dimensional object and of your detector. And uh, this voxel, in general, um, tells about the resolution of the, of the of your instrument, but it's not necessarily. So, if for example, object is big, like this, and this object is represented by many, many voxels, then of course, object is determined pre pretty well. But you can imagine if there is a, for example, this line is represented by one voxel, so the whole, you wouldn't see this object as this. You will see that the whole line will be within this voxel, so it will be cubed. One cube. So that's why if you have, um, for example, voxel size of one micron, and you have object of one micron, you wouldn't see if this object is round, or it's a cube, or it's a elongated, you will see a cube, because the whole voxel will tell you one grayscale. Within voxel, there is no difference of, of, uh, of intensity, right? So you have to understand this. If you want to image one micron object, probably you would think, I need probably three voxels per object. That's a minimum. So it means your voxel size should be around 0.3 microns for this uh, type of uh, object to image. So how this actually works? So let's say we have now object consists of these uh, voxels or pixels. In this case, we see everything in 2D. We send x-rays I0 through here. And then Ix, of course, will depend on uh, linear attenuation coefficients through these different uh, voxels here. So we can express Ix as this equation. So we know that Ix is, is dependent on I0, but it's also dependent on this distance and also on linear attenuation coefficient. If we can solve this uh, equation backwards, that we can find delta x and mu i, Actually, we can then represent our object in 3D. So equation-wise, you can solve this pretty well. You can do it. But in, in reality, what you do, you measure intensities at different angles with respect to the object. So you rotate object or you rotate uh, detector and the source around the object. And you collect lots of i-axis at different angles for each uh, detector pixel. And then you are using something which is called uh, image reconstruction. Because what you're collecting, you're collecting projections. And you have a lot of them. From these projections, you have to get back three-dimensional object, so through image reconstruction. And that's a computer kind of software which can do that for you. Okay? So that's what we will do, and it, this is the basis for CT volume reconstruction. and. Uh, I will show you how actually it's done one way. There are other ways as well. But for example, we have an object here. This two uh, bigger uh, kind of sphere, smaller sphere within this uh, background here. 
So if I send X-rays through here on my detector, which is 2D, I will get lighter part, dark part, lighter, a little bit lighter, depending on the object the density, and again, light part. So this is what my detector will see. It's a 2D object. But what we will do now, we will expand this, whatever detector sees, in the third direction. Exactly dimension this will agree with the dimension here. Okay, it's called bat projection. So instead of two-dimensional, now we have a three-dimensional object without any resemblance, of course, of these uh, parts here. But no, let's now collect that at the different angle here. So again, we're getting uh, on the detector some kind of image, and we can we do so-called back projection here. Now we have this, and we have this. Let's combine those two. Once we combine those, now we get two objects inside. The positions are correct. The shapes are not. But from even two projections, you already know where the objects are, which is fantastic. So it's immediately you see already something. This is called back projection uh, reconstruction, which you could use. And then, of course, if you have more angles than two, and usually you use maybe like 800, 600, 1200, 2500, and so on projections, you can reconstruct even the shape very nicely. So if you do very basic back projection reconstruction, you will end up something like that. As you can see, the image is blurry. You don't see much. It's just because it happens, everything happens in the Fourier space. And when you do this angular change, actually you go around some center point. And when you do this angular thing, at the very center, you have very dense uh, angular you know, density. At the outer space, you have more sparse because of this you know, uh, spherical coordinates. And that introduces artifacts. So instead of that, you actually pa you use a high pass filter. You filter out some frequencies, and then when you do that, actually you end up with nice reconstruction here. I don't want to go into details how this is done, but generally this is what you see, uh, that you do back projection reconstruction using filtered back projection uh, reconstruction, okay? So let's have an object now. Let's say we have an object consists of four cubes, A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D represents different densities, for example, even the color, uh, the, the grayscales are here the same. So we collect. Now on a detector, we send x-rays from um, left to right. So the detector gets information about this line as A plus B, and along this line as C plus D, right? Good, so we have this. Then we change the angle. Now this uh, pixel has information from C. Here we have AD, and here is B, okay? And we continue here, here, and now what we will do, we have an object, and we have this, only this information we have right here, right? So how we can recreate back what we, uh, how we can recreate our object. So we do back projection. So this information will be, so since we know this information, we'll put that information back into our volume. We don't know exactly that it's A, B, C, D, we're just putting A plus B everywhere, and C plus D here, okay? Then we get another projection, and we add that to each uh, voxel here, that information in here. And we continue adding everything into these uh, four cubes. And then we will see that actually we can subtract from something from here. So the sum of each entry can be subtracted, and eventually you will be left with only A, B, and C. You divide it by three, you're getting back your information. <laughs> so it's kind of very simple for four voxels, but imagine, you know, if you have a, a CCD detector 2,000 by 2,000 uh, pixels, you're getting 2,000 by 2,000 by 2,000 voxels. Definitely you need a good computer in order to do this kind of uh, back projection uh, reconstruction. But it's done, you know, now reconstruction can be done in 10, 15 minutes, very fast. Computers are good today, and, and as I said, most people know about uh, CT, because CT is done on, uh, usually in the medical field, it's very popular 
because you can really see, for example, you can investigate the brain, you can investigate, you know, uh, bone, uh, like knee, for example, if the cartilage is, is broken or something like that. You can do also uh, magnetic resonance as well. Some, you know, so, but X-ray is also very powerful. You can then see three-dimensional three uh, image of, of your body, for example. What I'm doing, I'm doing mostly on materials. And one of the materials, for example, could be this uh, camera. And again, this camera is a um, big object. And it doesn't require uh, micron size uh, resolution. But the coolness of this CT measurement is that you can go through the whole uh, object and see everything inside. And that's one of the things is it's very kind of visual, and another thing is you can investigate objects without disassembling it. So where the micro CT goes into, it's filling the niche between a medical field and between uh, instruments which are destructive. So if I show you this diagram, that's where the clinical CT and industrial CT are. So this is the image resolution. I'm defining resolution as capability to distinguish two objects which are very nearby, okay? So it means with the clinical CT, industrial CT, probably we can distinguish objects within 100 microns. The instrument which I will be talking is a micro CT instrument. So we put this micro next to the word just to distinguish that we're working at very different resolution. Uh, and this will be X-ray Diabursa, which I'm using. So my resolution is around here, one micron. There are other instruments, X-ray Dia Ultra, which goes to 50 nanometers. And then, of course, there are destructive techniques like FIB SEM. So you, you slice the material and you do SEM, which goes to 10 nanometers, for, exa for example. But you, you, you destroy material. And also, by slicing, you can change the material as well. So our instruments don't slice, don't change. Which, which is very good. So, x radia Versa and x radia Ultra, those are just names, but they stand for different instruments working, using different way how to magnify the image. And those are different ways is like this. One of the, it's called projection micro CT. With projection micro CT, we have in roughly one micron resolution. And we have very small source, and, and the magnification done by just geometrical magnification. Another instrument which goes to 50 nanometers, it's called lens-based. X-rays are not bended easily, so regular optical lenses won't work. So what you use, you use a Fresnel lenses uh, to shape X-ray beams. And, this, and eventually, Fresnel lens then for X-rays will work as an optical lens, and you do magnification similar as with the optical, uh, optical rays. But instrument which I'm talking today is mostly, yeah, it's using the, uh, pro, uh, this projection-based uh, magnification. As you can see, if my source is small, if I put object here, and I put detector at the large distance, I can magnify. Right? And the magnification will be related to this very nice, simple equation. So if I go now, and have my object moved around, you will see that I can have, can magnify or demagnify. And this way I can change magnification. So this is um, how it's done. And then if you can imagine this is object inside here, then if you have, and we have pixels, then this pixel will represent some, min, some volume from your uh, sample. This is the minimum size uh, of the volume which can be uh, acquired by a pixel here. But if you move this object closer or farther, so this volume will change, right? And of course, the source, as I said, for this type of magnification, we would like to have as small as possible, but that's uh, impossible. Usually the source size is around 10 to 5 microns. So what you're introducing, you're introducing some blurring effect. So because of the source size, you will get a little bit of uh, 
uh, intensity here, which is um, not exactly coming from one spot, because it comes from this part and then it comes from this part. So this particular point will be blurred here. And that's a problem. Uh, you can solve this problem by moving object farther from the source, but actually that reduces your magnification. So if you move object closer to the source, you increase magnification, but also you increase the blurring. One of the way to solve this, not to solve, but to, to mitigate this, is actually uh, use the design which Xradia came up, and right now Zeiss company bought Xradia um, uh, company, so now it's Zeiss. So what you would do, you would put the object somewhere, but you use this geometric magnification and you present image on a scintillator. And the scintillator will convert X-ray image into the visual image. Once you get visual image, then you can go and attach lenses and do extra optical magnification. So you do geometrical and then optical magnification and eventually this way you can move your sample farther away from the source, which solves two problems. One is the blurring will mini be minimized, and also you will put you can put bigger object and still get high resolution. Like for example, regular CT, which would use only the geometrical magnification, you will have a clearance around the sample versus resolution going somewhere like this, where the instruments which you have extra optical magnification, you can actually keep resolution even if your sample size increases or moved away. This is very important for samples where you do a big sample, but you want to see a very little inside at high resolution. So you can do that by moving a uh, sample away because it's big. Or you can, for example, do in situ type of measurements. Let's say you want to compress the object or you want to do a battery charge discharge and see if there are some kind of change in electrodes or something like that. And you want to have bigger thing in, in, your, you know, in your instrument. So this way you can put the sample kind of away. And this is the cartoon of these detectors where they have a scintillator and then there is optical magnification in here. So this particular big detector will be your only geometrical magnification and then these uh, these uh, four lenses will get extra optical magnification with different uh, magnification here times four, times 20, and times 40. So the instrument which I have is this, X-ray diverse 520. So this inside there we have uh, X-ray source. Here is the sample, in this case is a, um, a circuit board. I will show you an example about that. And then there's a detector assembly in here. So in contrast to medical CT where uh, they have to rotate source in the detectors because you don't want to be rotated inside the instrument, right? So here we, have, we can rotate the, the sample. And that's why our source and the detector are only move back and forth to change geometrical magnification and we rotate sample. In here. And then the samples might be, you know, different sizes, different shapes, and different resolutions you want from the samples. And they have different qualities, for example, air-sensitive samples or moisture-sensitive samples, or they want to be moist, like biological samples. So all that condition will require different mounting. And the mounting is whatever your imagination can uh, think of. Uh, I'm showing a few of them here. For example, the captain tube can be used to seal samples which are sensitive to environment. Or for example, if you want to keep uh, your sample moist, like biological sample. The very small samples might be mounted on some pins. Big foam samples might be just mounted with the sticky tape and stuff like that. So we have all the tools, pliers, <laughs> captain tapes, aluminum tubes, uh, glue, there is now a new thing, which is the epoxy, which is cured by UV light. Very useful. You put the sample in, you put that epoxy, and you position it as you want. You take your time, and then you shine UV light, and in a few seconds, it's, it's hard. So the main point for the sample prep 
is that when you do imaging, the sample doesn't move. That's the only thing that you need from it. Okay. For example, if you, if you bring a sample which is uh, moist and it dries out, definitely you will have a, you know, artifacts. Your sample is moving. You have a drift. So definitely at the, at the first ex uh, projection and the last projection, the position of your small part in the sample will move, will change. So that's the problem. So usually you want sample non-movable in this case. And the higher resolution, the less movable they should be. Okay, once we got this instrument, we got this instrument through a uh, grant. We applied to National Science Foundation, got above a, a million dollars, and we bought the instrument, and the engineer came and installed it, and he did some CT. And the first CT was done on uh, this object. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these uh, snacks. That's a US snack, which is called Cheerios. So this is the guy, and so the engineer got a Cheerio and put on a uh, wooden stick. And then you do tomography pretty fast, and then you get something like that. So your uh, software will show you something like this. So in here you will see rendering of 3D object, and then you see slices. So this particular slice is horizontal. This particular slice is vertical, and there is another vertical at 90 degrees. So that's what you usually see. And, and then by moving lines, for example, you get this green line, and you move it down, those two will change accordingly. So if you move it only down, this probably won't change, but here you will see something different, because you will be slicing at a different position, right? This way, by moving this you know, line, you actually can investigate what you see at different heights through the sample. So this is actually what is the reconstructed image would look like because here is, because you're shining X-rays this way, and that's what you see now. Of course, those are also reconstructed because this particular line will represent this image here. This is the slice. So those are three slices. So if I show a movie, so it will look like this. So we will have um, we're going from the bottom up. So this green line moving up and you see different slices here, and you see toothpick in the middle. So you definitely can investigate object very nicely. Now, if you want to play around with the 3D uh, reconstructed or, and rendered uh, image, you can do that as well. So you can get this uh, Cheerio, for example, 3D, and you can do a movie around. And not only that, you can actually uh, slice it in, in, in three-dimensional uh, image and also see something like that. So definitely this is very visual, very cool, and everybody likes it. I have another instrument, which are X-ray diffraction instruments, and they work in a, a reciprocal space. Nobody is interested to see objects in a reciprocal space. If you don't understand it, it's boring. But these are, everybody would understand. The same as scanning electron microscopy, everybody likes the images. So this is another example where it's a glass with some voids in it. And when you collect, you have voids on the glass. And then what you could do, you can so-called segment it and remove what you don't want, and you just leave voids. Now you can study size, distribution size, uh, and stuff like that. You have a different glass with different uh, density and size of voids. You can collect the image, and then you reconstruct. And then you can remove what you don't like, and you have this uh, on voids only left in your image. So you can study that, okay? So that's another example. Another example with Solus Yodkasis we did, we got a bunch of silk, rolled it, the silk, we got the silk like this, it's one millimeter, and those are strands, and then we could also do some phantomography here as well, and you can do this 3D rendering. And this particular image, I'm showing silk bunch at 4x optical magnification. So what I'm using, I'm using geometrical magnification, and then I do optical. And then I get this resolution. So we have a bunch which is around uh, one millimeter in diameter. And I can, you know, I can slice it and dice it my 3D volume now as I want, right? If I do higher magnification, then 
I'm actually now measuring something, not the whole bunch, which I saw here, but I'm measuring only inside small part of the bunch, but with higher resolution. Now, this is 20x optical magnification. And again, I, I can do this kind of um, uh, rendering and, and movies and stuff like that. So, so this is very interesting. And then, uh, of course, challenge was, and uh, I tried once in silk strand to measure. And I, as I said, the image is done by uh, getting the contrast between the background and the, and the object, right? Single si strand of silk gave me 98% of transmission. Means only 2% of information I'm getting. And still I, I was able to get this image. This is seven microns in diameter. And then I can also do this re rendering here as well. So this is for the silk. There is another example, aerogels. They said very light, very, very light uh, object. Light, uh, from my point of view, means very low density. Very low density, very little elect uh, electrons, which would you know, interact with x-rays, means very low absorption. But as you can see here, I can still get very good image of this. This is mostly through, because of the phase contrast. I will show you a couple of slides of how the phase contrast actually happens. But you can Im image aerogels. And also you can image batteries. Here's the battery, and as you can see from outside, it's a hard shell, which is the metal. And inside you have this rolled uh, sheet of uh, electrodes. Uh, it's a, like a cathode, separator, and that's your battery inside. And you can investigate that battery by looking through here and seeing, for example, if there is any damage within these you know, different uh, rolled electrodes. And when you cycle the battery, the damage might appear at some point. And then you can relate, okay, at this point I have a damage, so then maybe we can mitigate that or make, and these type of batteries are used in the Tesla cars, right? Not Duracell, but that size. So they pack a lot of these small batteries, and they come to us also measuring this kind of properties. I think they now have their own instruments. So that's what you can do. So now so you're imaging this, and as you can see, the scale bar is like one millimeter in here. You would say, okay, I imaged that, and I found that there is some fault into my battery. I still keep battery in my instrument, and now I'm switching my objectives, I'm switching my resolution and magnification, and I go inside. And then you can collect data uh, from part of the battery, from that part which you are interested. Here you see different parts, which is the, you know, like cathode, anode, electrode, and this is rolled, everything. And you can investigate now, you know, what is happening. Okay? So this is done continuously in our lab by, you know, battery research uh, people. So if they have these kind of batteries, they would investigate them. And they do cycle them as well. Uh, till, it, till they fail. Another way to use uh, this instrument is to do, you know, like fa uh, failure detection. For example, we got this board and something is, something is not working and they want to know, okay, what is not working? So we can zoom in from here to here to here and that thing is here. And then I would like you to zoom into this uh, contact area right here. So if I zoom in, I see this contact. So if you look at this, you see that these contacts are, you have one color, there is another color, this is like lighter, this is darker, it means there is something happening within this contact. They are not uniform, correct? So here, um, you have a zoom in, in image. And now, this is 2D. Something is happening, you don't know what. Then you do 3D, and then you will see that uh, some contacts are good, and some, as you can see, are not actually contacts anymore. They are separated. So this particular uh, device failed because of the contact issue here. And you can immediately can, you know, solve this problem and understand what is actually happening. During the soldering process, probably there was a, something uh, happening. Another cool example, and it was published in uh, science paper just this month, and that's why I'm not showing teeth, I'm showing another example. <laughs> it was a very cool experiment with, uh, we did in our 
I helped them a lot, so they acknowledged me, didn't put co-author on the paper, but acknowledged, that's very nice. So they studied bacteria. Usually you think about bacteria, they're very, very small. This bacteria is big. It's like five centimeters. And New York Times published this um, uh, article about this. Those are bacteria. Okay, they're big. This is the penny. And so what we did, we did CT on these bacteria. Why? Because they want to understand is it one organism or many. And this is important to say, okay, my bacteria is so long, but how do you know that it's a one organism? Because they might be combined from different, so we did CT. So this is the rendered bacteria here. So they were found somewhere from Guadalupe Lesser Antilles, somewhere here in the forests. And they were measured in my lab. So not only CT, but also other instruments, but CT, that's what I like, so that's what I actually help them with. So this is the one of the bacteria encased in some epoxy. And after the collection, you can do something interesting. So 6.3 millimeters, very, yeah, centimeters. I think. And then you can slice it and see through, you know, this bacteria. It has a hollow in the, side, in the middle and then walls. What is fantastic that these long bacteria, they don't know how actually they can live because all mechanism like uh, feeding themselves, how, for example, removing waste and so on happens through diffusion. And diffusion is slow in these organisms. So the longer they get, the slower the diffusion. And that's the problem. So if you want, you can just read that article very nice. Uh, good. So this also, because bacteria is mostly organic, uh, material so definitely lots of the image which you are getting is not only absorption a lot of there is a phase contrast I would like to show you how this phase contrast works just quickly so here is the a fly where we're using only absorption here okay as you can see we can see something definitely there is some uh, difference in, uh, in, uh, in density but it's not very clear so but if we, for example, keep the object and move the detector away, farther away, what happens when the X-rays go to the object, and mind this is from optics, maybe some of you understand, there is a refraction of, of rays. There are different materials, they refract X-rays differently. So you have a little bit of phase difference of rays which pass through material and through the background, for example. And this phase then would propagate towards the detector and you can detect edges of, so which result in intensity difference, like a spikes here, okay? So that happens more and more if you move your detector farther and farther. This, so it's called propagation-based phase contracts. And it's given to you, it's always there. It's just, you might not uh, concentrate on that, but every time you have it. And if you use this, for example, this one is done only with absorption contrast. You bring the detector very close. Uh, but if you do absorption plus phase, you see now object much clearer. It's not that the densities are different, but you see edges. Clear. So it's like a, somebody got a pencil and draw around each you know, uh, object inside some kind of you know, line. So that's what you are getting. So here's another example, bubbles. If you're using 90 kV X-rays, that's the highest energy of X-rays. Of course, you have lower energies as well. And you do this line profile, you're getting this green line. You have a little bit of phase contrast here, but this is the absorption contrast, and you see these bubbles kind of not very clear. Now you minimize voltage. What happens when you minimize voltage? Of course, lower energies will penetrate through the material harder. In this case, it's okay and it's good and it's beneficial because you increase in contrast. You see bubbles better and also you see this nice also uh, phase contrast in there as well. So the edge around here is because of phase contrast and then the difference in grayscale is your absorption contrast. Both of them can be used and should be used for some materials. 
Okay, generally went through a bunch of examples, and teeth is another example. We, we have a paper on that, but you know, images, I think some uh, movies that I'm not sure. If, do we have movies there? Yeah, we do movies, yeah. It's just, but generally, you can use it in life sciences, you can use this CT in material research, electronics. Uh, natural resources, we can scan, for example, not very popular, uh, probably subject the shale or the extraction of, uh, um, you know, oil from, uh, by fracking, right? For example, we, we do some research on that. For example, what happens is when you extract oil, lots of oil is left in the bubbles, which are, you cannot extract because it's, it's sealed. So they do fracking of the crack. Uh, rocks and extract that oil. Generally, when you extract the regular way oil, you extract maybe 40-50% and the rest is still there. When you crack uh, this, um, you know, these rocks, you can extract the rest. Good? Another, but there is a problem. Fracking is very destructive, right? So, like in Oklahoma, they do lots of fracking. And Oklahoma right now, we have more earthquakes than California, where we live. So, you know, something is not going well. So, I don't like fracking, cracking, but this is one of the things to measure. So they measure pore structures, fluid flow there. Uh, but also you can use for carbon sequestration. So you put carbon into the ground. Uh, of course, life sciences is a very important part. So recently I also scar scanned uh, uh, like heart valves. So uh, in Stanford Medical Facility, they would replace failed heart valves, and then they would bring these failed heart valves into a CT, measure them, and they try to understand what actually is failing. In the foam, as I show you, you know, this aerogel can be measured and, you know, different other things. And of course, in electronic failure analysis, one of the uh, big things to, to use the CT in here. So generally, it can be used for almost anything which has different amount of electrons versus the background. And you don't need much. Carbon immediately can be recognized. Even it doesn't have too many electrons in there. And lots of carbon is in biological materials. So you can do bio biological material. Concrete, we can do concrete as well. Because our instrument works from 30 kV up to uh, 160 kV. When you go to 160 kV, you can penetrate through uh, like two inch rock you can go through. Or you reduce to 30 kV, then you can work on, on, a, on a light materials. So generally, think of subject which you think, okay, I would like to look inside, but I don't want to destroy it, then CT is good for you, okay? And this is uh, what I would like to just show you, and thank you very much. So if you have any questions or comments, you can work that out now. I have one question. I work with uh, biological materials and, uh, and uh, I wonder would it be possible to do the same, for instance, with the, uh, with the vectors of diseases like uh, mosquitoes or biting midges? Uh, because some of the stages of malaria parasites, they develop in mid-gut of the vector. And uh, if maybe you have experience working with, the, with the such objects, and uh, how much it would cost, actually, to, to make this picture, as you showed with these uh, uh, cheetos or... Costs are sorry. Uh, we are shared facility, so uh, we have a user fee. Uh, CT for us is well, it's everything relative. But my instrument is daytime is twenty five dollars per hour, nighttime is fifteen dollars per hour. And now it depends on resolution on your sample, how long you will scan. So the practical measurements can happen from two hours to say twenty four hours. Above 24 hours is probably not practical. Below two, hour, below two hours is probably uh, too fast. So usually within that range. 
So higher the resolution would require, of course, uh, longer times because you magnify more. And then when you magnify more, you can imagine this cone beam, which you're trying to make this geometrical uh, magnification. But if your sample is small, and you want, you're not using full cone, you're using very little of the beam. Your intensity drops at the detector in order to gain back signal to noise, you count longer. So X-ray photons follow Poisson statistics. You're counting longer, you're getting better signal to noise. So, and that's what depends. So, for example, if you want to measure mosquitoes, you know, like, like this guy, something like that, right? I'm not sure, this is the, not mosquito, this is a fly. But that would be similar object like this, yeah. So you can image the whole object, maybe uh, faster, you know, a few hours. And then, let's say you want to concentrate it some kind of part, then you actually go into that part by zooming in and redo measurement, and that might take longer. Let's say, for example, you would do measurement two hours, and then you find the region of interest, which is really interesting for you to image. You zoom in and you, another, you do another 10. So 10 hours times 15 at night, if you're running through the night, is okay, 150. It's not bad, I think. Yeah. If you have one sample, if you have 100 samples. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> yes, sure, sure. Yeah. Adds okay. up. Yeah, I'm going to be a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to be a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to be a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to be a little bit. Медицина? Ну ладно, тогда не забудь дома. А, айску, айску. Я. Ta prasme, aš skirsiu mokslininkus į du tipus. Ta prasme, vieni yra, kurie gamina pavyzdėlius ir kiti, kurie yra matuoja. Material guy and tool guy. Aš esu tool person. Ta prasme, aš esu iš tos srities, kad aš duokit man ką nors ir mes padarysim bendrą kažkokį projektėlį, aš darysiu matavimą, jūs darysit pavyzdėlį. Ta prasme, benzinas mūsų idėjos, jūsų kažkas su tokio gandas. Bet taip pat lygiai, taip pat sikrotronė, kur yra matavimai ten, sakysim, tie angular result photo emission spektroskopiai, yra pas mūsų keli profesorai, kurie būtent yra instrument guys. Jie matuojo tam medžiagas ir elektroninę struktūrą tam medžiagų. Tai, jo, vat aš skirstau žmonės, aš esu iš tokios labiau instrumentinės pusės. Nes viską žmogui mokėti neįmanomas. Ta prasme, straipsnių, kur yra vienas autorius, dažnai nepamatai. Tai todėl... Žinai, amžiai laikai yra. Teorijai. Ja. Tai va, tai aš tikrai mėlai prisidedu ir mėlai stengiuosi padėti ir daryti iš tos pusės mano mokslas. Bet aišku, viską aš noriu surišti su savybėm. Tai todėl, kas gamina medžiagas, jis nori pamatyti, kodėl savybė skaičiasi, sakysim, skaičiasi struktūrą ar morfologiją. Aš tada darau tą morfologiją ir mes matom, kodėl. Taip susiriša viskas į bendrą tokį. Mes čia nedarom su gyvais, jo ten reikalingi atskiri protokolai ir vienas norėjo man atnešti pelę, bet aš sakau, ne, mes nematuojam pelių. Mes kanarėlių galime. Jo, ten truputėlį kitoks. Tie, sakysim, širdies plaky, sakysim, matuoja širdį radiologai, tai jie turi prisiderinti prie širdies plakymo ritmą, kad galėtų matuoti būtent pirmą kardiogramą nuimą ir paskui matuoja būtent tuo metu, kai pagal šitie susinchronizuoja. 
Tem que fazer todo. Não é para nada. Aš noriu pabrėžti, kad tai yra Micro CT, kadangi yra kita rezoliucija, negu medikai žino. Taip, yra Nano CT, aš rodžiau vieną tą instrumentėlį, kuri šitagi... Jo, jo, kažkur taip, taip. Irgi kokių dešimt penkiolikų metų nano irgi yra, jo. Jis dirba biškį kitokių režimų. Va, kaip aš čia rodžiau, micro CT turi tą geometrinį didinimą. The nano CT, kuris eina iki 50 nanometrų. Čia ko gero? 30... 50 ko gero. Jo. Taip. Ir šiuo atveju mes naudojam, kadangi optiniai lešiai, čia jie ne optiniai, bet bet Frenelio tokios lenzės, bet čia jau reikalinga monokromatinė šviesa rengiama. Kadangi optika veikia ant vienos daugiausiai ant vienos bangos, nes fokusuoja skirtingas bangas skirtinguose vietose, aš taip suprantu. Ta aberracija neatsiranda? Ne, mes, ok, jo, tai teisingai skirti, bet tada mes dirbam su šitom linijom, kurios yra labai siauras. Ta prasme, mes galim spektro panaudoti ne tą continuous radiation, bet mes panaudojam karakteristik radiation. Ir čia yra mano kromatinė banga, sakysim, 9 kilo elektron voltų nuo vario metalo. Ir tą galima naudoti micro CT. Nano CT, čia būtų nano. Tai būtent tai. Nu, didesnis ko gerai, taip, jo. Taip, va čia būtent ir rodo, kad šitagi, kai turi nano CT, tu gali įskirti 50 nanometrų linijas. Tuo metu micro CT mes galim įskirti vieno mikrono, o šitas atrodytų kaip kažkoks išplaukęs vaizdas, nieko daugiau nesimato. Mes planuojam nano CT irgi įsigyti kažkurio metu. Ar viena? Kaip mes? Olyk, kur dar juda šitą visą mokslą įsigyti? Dar mažėjimo? Ko gero, truputį mažės, iki 30 gal nanometrų galima važiuoti, bet taip pat daugiausia vystomi detektoriai ir šaltinis bandoma padidinti šaltinio galę, kad galima būtų matuoti, sakysim, keičiantis laikui. Su šitais, kaip sakiau, ok, jeigu mes matuojam keturias valandas, nu tai, jeigu kas nors per keturias valandas keičias, tas yra blogai. Tuo metu, jeigu mes padidinsim galę šaltinio ir galėtum pamatuoti per dešimt minučių, tai kas nors tokio lieto, kuris per dešimt minučių, sakysim, per valandą ar per dvi įsivisto, mes galim jau su tokiu šaltiniu matuoti. Taip pat detektoriai jie būtų labiau efficiency detektorių galėtų didėti ir daugiau to rengeno fotonų surinkti. Signalas triukšma šitagi santykis gerėjo. Jo, daugiausia ten vyksta. Su nano CT, vat kaip šitas aparatas, sakiau, čia reikia turėti monokromatinį šaltinį. Monokromatinis šaltinis naudoja tas karakteristinės linijas. Jos yra, jų nėra, sakysim, 30 kilo, reikia labai sunkių metalų, kad 30 kilo voltų būtų energijos karakteristinė linija. Tai dažniausiai naudoja variją, molibdena. Varijas turi 9 kilo voltų liniją, molibdenas turi gal 17 kilo voltų liniją. Tai dabar, jeigu yra 9 kV ir įdėdė visą dantį, tas rengeno spindulis tos energijos neperės per dantį. Nieko nebus. Ta dantį reikia tada mažinti. Tada jį pjaustyti, išpjauti dviejų, trijų mikronų bandinį ir jį galima prašviesti. Tai čia yra problema su šitais. Jo.
Ose me bus ir atsakymas, bet o Bayer Frinčiants, ar ne, į dviejo palaužį iškumą, arba mechanijos įtempimus galima stebėti? Ar jie matome ir kaip jie atrodo? Šitas... Viskas, ok, daugiausiai yra kontrastas yra dėl tankio skirtumo. Čia, ką matai. Dažniausiai yra tas lūžis, ta face contrast biškiai gali būti, bet šitagi daugiausiai matai dėl absorpcijos. Aš manau, jeigu darai įtempimą, tai tu pamatytum gal kaip objektas keičiasi, ko gero, jo morfologija. Bet ar ten įsivysto kažkoks strain? Aš manau, saugu matyti. Tu matai, kaip objektas pats turis, ilgis, storis, keičiasi. Daugiausiai tai yra dėl absorpcijos, dėl, reiškia, tas kontrastas sudaromas. Truputį. O, sakykime, jeigu šitas tiesiogiai nesimato, bet kaip buvo lydį to stiklo, ar ne, gabaliukai, ar galima kaip turėti bandinio laikyklį, ar tą terpę, kuri būtų kaitinama arba šaldoma, sakykime, iki šimtų, galima, kad tą patį burbuliavimas arba susilydimą stebėti. Tas greitas matavimas priklauso nuo to, koks tavo stiprus šaltinis, reiškia, kiek fotonų tu gali duoti, praktiškai tu signal tunuosi ir gerą gauti. Tam reikia labai galingo šaltinį, ko gerą. Mes nematuojam pavyzdėlių, kurie keičiasi laike, dažniausiai pakeiti atnešį matuoji, tada vėl pakeiti vėl atnešį matuoji. Arba tu vietoj gali keisti, bet kai kažką pakeitė, jis turi jau būti stabilus matavimo metu. Kadangi matavimas užtrunka, sakykime, keturios valandos. Šiaip jau viskas yra matoma, bet kadangi yra tridimensinis vaizdas, mes galim Viską matyti. Čia yra klyjai, čia yra tas, čia yra tas, čia yra tas. Viską mes dėlėm. Aš irmai duosiu tam tikrus failus. Ten yra plomba vienam danty. Labai gražiai matosi, kaip tai prikybusi. Ne visur prikybusi. Ir matosi labai gražiai, kad šitagi čia prikybusi, ten neprikybusi. Bet jeigu aš čia pradėsiu tą rodyti, čia mes niekad nebaigsim, kadangi mes pradėsim nagrinėti tas visus laisvis. Reiškia, kaip atsiu. Kaip? A, kaip už tritų? O, vaizdo? Ne. Aš tarp kitko dantų neklyjuoju visai. Aš paėmau putoplasto gabaliuką, aš spaudžiu. Putoplastas labai lengvas, su tom energijom, kur aš žiūriu dantį, ir iš danties išgaunu gerą kontrastą, aš putoplasto vėl praktiškai visai nematau. Net jeigu ir matyčiau, jis yra kitoj vietoj. Net aš jeigu visą dantį kišiau į kažkokį putoplastą ir matuočiau, aš gaučiu vaizdą, čia yra putoplastas, o čia yra dantis, aš galiu dantį žiūrėti. Ta prasme, viskas ir Tas nebent klyjai gali sugadinti dantį, bet... Ne, man atrodo, ne patokai. Ne, 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 
A jeigu jūs norit matyti kažką išorę ir kažką ten kliuojat, aš tada nekliuočiau toj vietoj, aš kliuočiau kitur. Jeigu man labai įdomu paviršius danties ir aš noriu pasižiūrėti, ar jis ten porėtas, ar jis ten kažkoks, aš tos vietos nekliuočiau. Aš jau palikčiau laisvę. Arba galima kliuoti, bet kito kontrasto klyjais. Jeigu kontrastas kyrėsi, iš kartų išsiskiria, matai dantį, matai... Labai gražiai dantės matosi, tas yra išorinis sluosnis, yra labai tankus, jis yra vienas, turi, reiškia, ta graiskėl, vidus yra kita, tad tiek įtrūkimai vėl. Dantės labai geras pavyzdėlis. Jo, jo, taip, būtent. Taip, jis labai kieta medžiaga, jinai turi daug... Jo, taip, taip. Ir iš principo galima tak sukalibravus prietaisą, galima pasakyti tankį medžiagos. Galima ties numerius tiesiog. 